I'm really happy to see you again on the screen, and I hope to see you soon in Ghent next, next month. Um, today, I would like to welcome you to this joint uh, webinar on MegaRioter. And it, will be in, it has been organized by the EAU Working Group and on Pediatricology and the ESPU Educational Committee. Uh, I would like to thank you again, the school, the European School of Theology for the help and support. And we have today the honor to welcome two great uh, pediatricologists from Europe. You will have this webinar on Megarator and don't hesitate to ask us a lot of questions in the question and answer uh, chat uh, and on the back uh, on the top of your screen. So we'll start uh, today the first presentation with our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Emilio Merini. Welcome. Thank you. So Professor Merini is a pediatric surgeon and pediatric pathologist from Italy. He was the former head of the Department of Pediatric Surgery at uh, the Children's Hospital of Turin in Italy. And he, we have the honor that he is our president in the ESPU uh, Society. Thank you very much. And then we'll, uh, uh, Professor uh, Selsuk Saile will talk uh, the, as a second speaker, and I will introduce himself uh, soon. You can you. start, Professor Merlin. Thank you very much. Uh, dear, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I am going to talk about uh, the workup, indications, uh, timing, uh, and the modalities of treatment. Uh, of uh, primary mega ureters. I have no disclosures. Mega ureter is uh, a purely descriptive term that describes uh, a ureter that is uh, larger than normal. It is synonymous with a megalo ureter, a wide ureter, or a hydro ureter. The upper normal value for the ureteral diameter has been conventionally set by Kolk many, many years ago at the seven millimeters. And depending on the extent and the severity of the dilatations, mega ureter can be also divided into three types, from type one with limited dilatation to type three with a long convolute and dilated ureter. More than 40 years ago, Lowell King, proposed a classification of mega ureter that is still in use today. He divided the mega ureters into obstructed, refluxing, non-obstructed, non-refluxing, and obstructed and refluxing. Each category is further subdivided into primary and secondary. Primary are those mega ureters that have a problem at the UVJ uh, at the UVJ junction, so at, uh, they can be obstructed or refluxing. Secondary mega ureters are those uh, that uh, where the dilatation of the ureter and the hydronephrosis is a secondary to some uh, bladder problems like uh, neuropathic bladder or valve bladder or some uh, systemic disease uh, like diabetes insipidus. So primary mega ureters include the primary obstructed mega ureters and the primary non-obstructed, non-refluxing mega ureters. They represent approximately 23% of all prenatally detected hydronephrosis and are found in 25% of children with obstructing uropathy. They are much more common in males, more common on the left side, bilateral in 25% of cases, and in uh, 10 to 15% of cases, the contralateral kidney is either dysplastic or absent. Most uh, primary mega ureters uh, identified in, in the fetus are primary non-obstructive, non-refluxing mega ureter. Different explanations have been proposed to explain the etiology of non-obstructive ureteral dilatations. The like a high fetal urinary output in the third trimester increased the compliance of fetal and neonatal ureter, but the attention of the investigators has focused mainly in a delay in the maturation of the UVJ, especially of the longitudinal muscle layer of the ureteral wall, which is the last layer to develop and is responsible for the propulsion of the urine into the blood. In the pre-sonographic era, 
most mega ureters uh, were found because uh, they were symptomatic. And uh, at that time, uh, they were re represented 8% of all children affected by hydronephrosis. The most common presenting symptoms uh, were UTI, hematuria, pain, and uremia in the pre sonographic era. But even now, in the era of prenatal diagnosis and widespread ultrasound, 17% of children affected by obstructed mega ureters present because of a history of acute flank pain. Ultrasound, mega 3 scans, and MRI represent the mainstay for the diagnosis and follow-up of primary mega ureters. MCUG, of course, is essential to exclude reflux and bladder pathology as a possible cause of ureteral dilatation. So we can find that uh, we can uh, we can find here the diagnostic algorithm uh, for prenatally diagnosed mega ureters. Uh, of course, the mega uterus that has been diagnosed prenatally needs a postnatal ultrasound to confirm the dilatation. Next, uh, VCUG is uh, the further step that allows us to divide the mega ureters into reflexing mega ureter and non reflexing mega ureters. Non reflexing mega ureters, uh, persisting non reflexing mega ureters uh, may undergo MAG3 diuretic coronography that divides them into those who have a differential renal function, which is under 40% that uh, generally are treated surgically, and those who have a differential renal function above 40% who may undergo conservative treatment. But if uh, during conservative treatment, we observe a functional drop, an increasing diameter of the ureter, and the onset of symptoms, they may be shifted to operative treatment. Ultrasound is uh, the first imaging tool. As we can see here, we see a dilated ureter behind the bladder with a nice rounded ending. This is sort of called inverse um, reverse bell, sh uh, bell shape. And here is a mega ureter in a transverse view. Mega ureter is also extremely useful uh, for the follow up of uh, mega ureters. We can see here a child who is. Uh, uh, who, uh, who had his first mega, his first ultrasound when he was one month old. We see the dilated ureter, the relevant hydronephrosis here. 10 months later, the hydronephrosis was much less and uh, there was a still a huge dilatation of the ureter behind the bladder. After 10 months, we can see that the hydronephrosis has completely disappeared and uh, the ureter is much less dilated than it used to be before. Once a reflux has been excluded, of course, we, have, we need uh, to distinguish between primary obstructed mega ureters and primary non-obstructed mega ureters. But assessment of partial obstruction in asymptomatic cases is difficult because obstruction cannot be directly measured. It's also difficult to define. Therefore, we must mainly rely on indirect measurements that may give us a hint to the presence of an obstruction, which is a reduction in, uh, <clears throat> in separate function or a delayed drainage curve at renography. But the situation is not so simple. We will see it in the next slides. The most common test that is employed nowadays to assess obstruction is the diuretic coronography using TC99 and MAG3. But also MRI urography is currently included in the diagnostic protocol in uh, an increasing number of, of cases. And in most, in many institutions now, it is um, the investigation of choice that has substituted uh, both I, the old IVP, but also MAG3 scan. The MAG3 is the most used drug of pharmaceutical because it has some definite advantages over DTPA because it is extracted by tubular secretion. Its clearance depends on plasma flow rather than on GFR and it has a lower background activity than DTPA. Of course, uh, to be reproducible, the diuretic renography should, be fo should follow a protocol, a strict protocol. The patient must be 
very well hydrated. The timing and dosage of frosamide must be standardized. The blood must be kept empty or must be emptied during the, the, the examination to avoid the obstructive effect of the full bladder and then not to obscure the distal ureter. Uh, separate the separate activity time curves uh, should be generated over the kidney and the ureter, and the child should be kept in an upright position at the end of the test to assess the effect of the gravity on the drainage curve. The parameters that are calculated in the diuretic retinography are the differential renal function, the drainage curve with the parameters of tubular um, of time to maximum, time and half activity, residual activity after micturition. The drainage curve of the MAC3 scan depends on many factors apart from obstruction, and especially newborn and infants has a limited relevance in the decision-making process. T half is influenced by obstruction, by also, but also by the tracer type, the hydration, the pelvic volume, the degree of bladder fullness, dosage and timing of frusamide administration, the renal function, the type of region of interest chosen and the modalities of t half calculation. As we can see here, and, and this is a very <clears throat> clear example of how different factors can influence the curve. We, you can see here, both curves, so they all, they both appear obstructed. They have an accumulation pattern, but uh, the left kidney is not obstructed. It's just a small kidney, a more small dysplastic kidney, but without any obstruction. The right kidney is an obstructed one. The, both curves uh, look very similar, but the pathology underlying is uh, very much different. And of course, you have to look at the curves, but also have a look at uh, the images uh, of the MAG3, just to, to understand uh, what uh, is uh, going on. So beside renal obstruction and renal function, the drainage depends also on the urinary flow on the volume of the collecting system. So we can conclude that good drainage excludes obstruction, but the delayed drainage is not equivalent to obstruction, especially in pediatric age and whatever parameter is used. These uh, famous uh, and very well known experts in uh, nuclear medicine have concluded a few years ago about the interpretation of the renogram. The diuretic renogram remains a reliable test despite the guidelines and protocols that are different from center to center. The difficulties that we find in the interpretation of the results because there is no accepted cutoff value for normal differential renal function because the morphology of the curve is purely descriptive and delayed drainage may be only apparent. They, say that residual activity in the post-voiding films of the so-called NORA parameter is a more reliable parameter than T half. Euromagnetic resonance is also extremely useful because it delineates the non-functioning renal units. The contrast enhanced T1 weighted images offer a modern alternative to IVP and MAG3 scans. T2 sequences provide the static water images uh, and assessment of adjacent soft tissues. And uh, with the three-dimensional reconstruction, your MRI offers a very an attractive alternative to any other diagnostic option. As we can see here, the uh, gadolinium uh, DTPA enhanced MRU allows the measurement of differential renal function of the renal transit time, of the parenchymal caliceal transit time, and other functional parameters that can substitute completely the MAG3 scan. And in addition, it can provide an excellent anatomical details. We can see here three-dimensional reconstruction. We see, we see very nicely the mega ureter and also the very tiny obstructed segment at the very distal portion of the mega ureter. 
So after we have decided, we have made our workup and the diagnostic workup in in the mega ureters, we have to decide which ones needed some surgery or some treatment, or which ones can be followed conservatively. See the BAPO consensus statement has. In, an, in 2014 has uh, uh, decided that symptomatic, uh, has proposed that the symptomatic primary mega ureters and those causing a progressive reduction of kidney function need an early surgical repair. They also have stated that asymptomatic primary mega ureters associated with a normal renal unit, especially newborn and infants, should be treated expectantly despite the apparently obstructed drainage curve. If you look at the results of expectant treatment, these were the first papers that were published after that expectant treatment became a reality in the late years of the last century. We can see that at a short and medium uh, follow up, uh, only 15% of these, of, the, of these patients uh, needed some surgery, and the great majority were improved or stable, and they need, did not need uh, any further surgery. More recent uh, series uh, published uh, on the same argument to show that apparently the number of patients uh, that need uh, uh, some type of surgery go from uh, 10 to 15 percent and the great majority again almost uh, 85 to 90 percent uh, are improved or stable but of course, all these authors uh, try to find a, to find the predicting factors for spontaneous resolution, and approximately all of them say the same thing. So, Calisti found that there was a strong correlation between the grade of primary mega ureters and spontaneous resolution. Liu stated that spontaneous resolution uh, is uh, uh, more easily found in those mega ureters uh, whose diameter is uh, under one centimeter. And uh, McLellan um, published in his series that the hydronephrosis grade uh, is a strong predictor of spontaneous resolution. Of course, uh, the less hydronephrosis of the mogaeuritis with the less hydronephrosis are resolved more quickly and more completely, while uh, those that have a grade four or grade five hydronephrosis did not resolve or took a longer time. But if we look at a long-term follow-up of 74 mega ureters, so we can see that the number of patients who needed surgery rose to 27%. So probably the longer the follow-up, the, the more number, the, 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 the greater number of patients, the greater the number of patients who need some type of surgery. On a univariate analysis, agent presentation, mega ureter grade, differential renal function, and washout pattern were significant predictors of spontaneous resolution. But on multivariate analysis, only agent presentation and washout pattern were significant predictors of some satisfactory uh, conservative treatment. So expect can conclude that expectant management of uh, primary mega ureters is safe and only 10 to 20 or 25 percent of these patients eventually need surgery. The criteria for shifting to the surgical management uh, have been stated again by the BAPU consensus uh, conference. They have stated that a decreasing renal function of more than 10% of the initial value or a differential renal function decreasing under 40%, progressive increase in ureteral diameter, onset of symptoms or appearance of stones are all criteria for shifting to a surgical treatment. Most questionable is the persistence of a large and tortuous ureter after a reasonable period of observation, because the reasonable period of, those of observation does not mean anything uh, can be longer or shorter. So this is a very personal and a not objective con con concept. Of course, uh, the more we observe the mega ureters, uh, the easier we find complications. For instance, this was a 10 years old boy who had uh, uh, a 
a big, a larger stone in the terminal ureter. We can see here the, the, the stone in, in the ureter resembling the terminal end of the ureter. We can also see here the small obstructed portion of, of the ureter. So this is a complications. Uh, <clears throat> The treatment of mega ureter, treatment of mega ureters can be subdivided into definitive surgical treatment and temporizing measures. Many pediatric urologists, in fact, prefer not to perform an extensive ureteral remodeling or ureteral neocystostomy because uh, uh, the procedure may be difficult because of the um, relatively high complication rate and the risk of damage in the bladder. So. Um, there have been proposed uh, different temporizing measures like cutaneous ureterostomy, insertion of JJ, refluxing and ureter neocystostomy or endoscopic balloon dilatation. Cutaneous ureterostomy is the oldest uh, method for managing uh, these patients. The disadvantages are represented by the stomal stenosis uh, that ranges from 8 to 20%. Um, approximately one third of the patient have a febrile UTIs despite uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and bilateral cutaneous ureterostomy may cause a permanent loss of bladder capacity. So it was proposed to insert uh, a double J in the ureter or in both ureter as a temporizing measures to treat mega ureters in infants under one year of age. In the long term uh, follow up, uh, the complication rate was about one third again. And after removal of the double J, approximately 50 to 60, 70% of the patient did not need any other uh, type of uh, surgery. So it was a definitive treatment. Refluxing a ureteral reimplant was proposed by Martin Kiefer in 2005 as a temporary treatment. It's a sort of trade-off of obstruction with reflux. It consists in transecting the ureter above the obstructed segment and creating an end-to-side anastomosis with the bladder in a freely refluxing fashion. The advantages in a small, this is small series was where the fact that all patients had an improved drainage, that the separate function remained unchanged, but all of them needed a formal reimplantation with an anti-reflex technique uh, generally at an average age of uh, 16 months. The last uh, temporizing uh, procedure is endoscopic balloon dilatation. It's been becoming very popular now. Uh, this was first described as an initial uh, treatment for children with complicated uh, primary obstructed mega ureters. The technique consists in the endoscopic dilatation of the UVJ using a dilating balloon, 3.7 uh, French, introduced through a cystoscope. The balloon is then inflated at the pressure of 14 atmospheres and kept in place until the usually visible stenotic ring disappears. So we can see here the very tight ring that becomes progressively less tight and then disappears. At the end of the procedure, a double J is inserted and kept for one month, one to two months. The results of endoscopic balloon dilatations have been reported recently in 79 cases and they had a very high successful rate of 87.3, 60% after a single endoscopic balloon dilatation. And uh, <clears throat> the others uh, need some uh, further treatment, like endoscopic treatment of reflux in 16%, and a new endoscopic uh, dilatation in restenosis. Uh, the failures uh, rate was 12%, so it's very low. In consideration of these results, uh, these also pro propose endoscopic balloon dilatation as the primary and definitive treatment of choice at any age. But then uh, still uh, there are patients uh, who need uh, some surgical operations to be done, operation to be done. The surgical principles of the treatment of obstructed omega ureters uh, were established by Pacan uh, almost uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Resection, it included the resection of the aperistaltic segment, the reimplantation uh, using an anti-reflex technique, uh, 
Uh, Pakin uh, said, uh, stated that the submucosal tunnel length was uh, at least had to be at least five times the diameter of the ureter. And so the ureters that were wider than eight to 10 millimeters are needed to be reduced in diameter. The caliber of the ureter can be reduced either by folding the ureteral wall, following the star or Kalichinsky procedure, or by excisional tapering of the ureteral wall, as was described by Hander. The ureter can be reimplanted later in using all the usual intravesical or extravesical procedures. Despite that fact that the majority of pediatric urologists, as I said, prefer to perform such a surgery after the year, one year of age, uh, in literature, satisfactory long-term results have been reported even in infants operated before one year of age. So the reduction of the ureteral diameter can be achieved either with the enfolding of, of the wall, we place some, uh, some Lambert sutures and uh, the, the wall of the ureter is enfolded inside the lumen of the wall, or the following the Kalichinsky procedure, uh, part of the ureter is excluded, and uh, this excluded part of the of the ureter is folded behind the ureter and then implanted in the bladder. Both uh, procedures are useful if the ureteral diameter is less than 12, 10, 12 millimeters. If uh, the ureteral diameter is above uh, 10 or 12 millimeters, I personally prefer to do an excisional tapering of the ureters. Now I can I show you few slides of how I do this procedure. I isolated the ureter outside from outside the, the bladder in an extravesical uh, fashion, and the entry point in the bladder is closed with some sutures. Then the adventitial layer is detached from the muscular layer in uh, the portion that will be later resected. You can see here outlined the portion of the ureter that will be uh, will be resected. After resection, of course, uh, the, this portion should be the less vascularized part of the ureter. Then um, the ureter is reconstructed in two layers uh, using a running suture, approximately an interrupted suture uh, distally, and uh, um, the dentition layer is closed over it in a pants over in a pants over vest fashion to avoid the fistulas. Uh, you can see here the reconstructed ureter. Then the bladder is open and the new entry point of the ureter is secured to the source muscle that you see here with some sutures to stabilize the entry point, especially to stabilize and fix this portion of the bladder where we will reimplant the ureter. Then the ureter is placed in a very long, you see this long tunnel that is created in a very in a fixed uh, portion of the bladder, so avoiding any kinking with bladder filling. The new orifice is also in the trigon, very close to the bladder neck, so every endoscopic procedure is much is made very easy. And the um, uh, the other ureter is very close, so you must pay a lot of attention when you do this replantation and not to injure the other ureter. I have used this uh, procedure for more than 30 years uh, with uh, uh, an almost 100% success rate. I had only one patient who needed to refashion uh, this reimplantation. So I hope to see all of you at the next ESPU Congress in Ghent. I hope to, to, to see all of you and welcome over all of you from 8 to 11 of June in, in Ghent for the first ESPU Congress face-to-face -face after two years of stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Merlini, for this large and um, with a lot of details review about uh, Mega Yurta. I would like to thank you, uh, all the, the close 200 participants who attend this uh, webinar. It's really a great number. And I would like to uh, welcome and introduce my friend, Professor Selsuk Saile, who is a professor of urology and professor of pediatric urology at the University of Biruni in Istanbul. And he's the uh, chairman of pediatric urology at the Memorial Hospital Groups in Turkey 
and is one of the most famous member of the EAU guideline panel and the uh, EAU working group in pediatricology. And he will start his talk about how to manage a primary obstructive megaliota. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great honor for me to share the screen with two experts. Well, Dr. Uh, Professor Emilio Merlini made an excellent overview of mega ureter. Uh, and I will try to summarize you um, a little bit about uh, what is the feature? Uh, is there any role of robotic surgery in the treatment of mega ureter? Uh, so I will try to give you an overview about it. I have no conflicts of interest and all pictures and videos are from my own personal archives. Well, as you know that uh, antenatal ultrasound is a routine, uh, routinely performed since the last 30 years. Uh, and accordingly, a lot of urological abnormalities are detected and majority of them are with antenatal hydronephrosis. As mentioned before, mega ureter accounts around four to 7% of all antenatal hydronephrosis. And uh, the def as the definition of mega ureter, Emilio mentioned again, uh, the general consensus is that the distal ureteral diameter larger than seven millimeter uh, is uh, diagnosed as the mega ureter in children. Also, this is the latest consensus statement of the British, British Association of Pediatric Urologists as well. So uh, there are some symptoms, but majority of them are uh, diagnosed during the prenatal period. Some of them uh, apply to the uh, clinics with recurrent urinary tract infection, uh, some of them with abdominal pain, some with hematuria, uh, very rarely, and some of them, in, uh, if bilateral and untreated, they can uh, come to the departments with uh, renal insufficiency. I will pass these slides a little bit quickly because they are already summarized by Emilio. I think the definition of obstruction is very critical. Uh, and this is the state of the art for the pediatric urologist. Um, the definition in the EAU guidelines is just like as it is. If left untreated, will cause progressive renal damage. So how are we going to uh, predict? The first one is the recurrent urinary tract infection under antibiotic prophylaxis. The second one is progressive hydrouretary nephrosis on the ultrasound, in the serial ultrasounds. The other one is progressive loss of function at the DMSA scan, and uh, also the split function, if, if it's going down to the 40%, it's also another factor. But none of them are uh, only uh, one factor. Uh, they should be some, most of the time together. So it's a clinical judgment and it needs some expertise. And also, according to the EAU guidelines, we know that the majority of the cases can be treated conservatively. Uh, some of them uh, can be um, treated with endoscopic measures, uh, and some of them may require reimplantation. But uh, we know that um, less than 15% requires reimplantation uh, in children. So, here is the question Is there a role of robotic assisted laparoscopic ureteral reimplantation? in the treatment of obstructive mega ureters. Now we are going to discuss about it. As you know that robotic surgery, especially when we talk about the uh, reimplantation, uh, it's not a very old procedure. Uh, it's not, we don't have robust uh, evidence uh, in those um, the procedures. When we look at the literature about reimplantation, it first started in the uh, pig models and then it's, uh, the clinical studies show that in 2008, uh, so it's been like uh, 14 years since the first uh, clinical um, trial has been published. When we look at, in general, uh, about robotic surgery uh, in the EAU guidelines, uh, so there are only a few uh, parts, including robotic surgery. Uh, this doesn't mean that robotic surgery has a robust evidence but uh, it is being mentioned in those parts. What are they? The first one is UPJ obstruction. Especially we have the best uh, available evidence in the UPJ obstruction about pyeloplasty, of course. And then we have a lot of uh, publications in reflux, 
Uh, also, in some complex zones, an ectopic ureter is being mentioned in the EAU guidelines. But of course, robotic surgery in children is not limited to those indications. It is also being performed in many of the operations in pediatric urology, as well as pediatric surgery and cardiac surgery in children as well, also for transplantation. So let's uh, talk about the general advantages. Uh, when, uh, when we again look at the EAU guidelines, uh, we see that, especially for pyeloplasty, uh, they have the robotic surgery has got the same success rate with the open surgery, but also with a decreased pain, decreased length of stay, and better cosmetics. So we want to achieve those outcomes for ureteral reimplantation and for the mega ureter as well. But do we have those advantages? That's questionable. Now we are going to talk about it. In the last uh, two years, there was a specific section in the EAU guidelines published. It's, uh, it's about the general principles of laparoscopy. Uh, and uh, there are some good uh, summary of evidence that you can see. Laparoscopy and robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery can now be safely performed in children. Uh, the general benefits are, as I said, decreased pain, shorter convalescence, and better cosmesis. The limitations uh, to be considered are increased operative time, smaller working space, cost is an important limitation, availability is an important limitation, and surgeon and anesthesiologist experience is another limitation for robotic surgery as well. Cosmesis is one of the advantages uh, for robotic surgery for the reimplantation. Both of the patients uh, on the left side and on the right side, uh, they were treated with uh, robotic bilateral extra vesical ureteral reimplantation. On the left side with robotic surgery, on the right side with the open surgery. So the cosmetic outcome is uh, apparently looks like better uh, or expected to be better in the robotic surgery. When we talk about ureteral reimplantation for vesicoureteral reflux, we have much more evidence. So this uh, study is uh, a systematic review published uh, one year ago in uh, 1300 uh, children uh, with overall success more than uh, 92%, which is almost equivalent to open surgery. So we can say that uh, if we talk about reimplantation in vesicoureteral reflux, well, we have growing evidence. But when we come to the robotic surgery <clears throat> for the uh, mega ureter, then we have very, very few evidence in the literature. This is one of the latest studies published. This is a comparison between open and robotic surgery. The operative times are comparable. Success rates are comparable. Length of stay is shorter for robotic surgery, but uh, also cosmesis was better for robotic surgery as well. But you can see clearly that the numbers of the participants are very low. <clears throat> so we can see it as the just the case series. This is another study published by the Philadelphia group. 18 patients undergone robotic assisted laparoscopic ureteral reimplantation for the treatment of mega ureter. <clears throat> some of them were uh, performed with excisional tapering, some with non tapering. There was an increased operative time is if excisional tapering was performed. In this study, six of the 13, uh, six of the 18 patients uh, was uh, diagnosed with febrile urinary tract infection three months after surgery. So I think this is a huge number, but maybe this may be limited to those case studies as well. This is another case series with 14 patients. And in this study, uh, the success rate was high. The complication was limited to only one patient with postoperative paralytic ileus, uh, which is uh, passed uh, after three days of intervention, three days of follow-up. So this is a, a, actually the largest study that we can find in the literature about uh, robotic uh, ureteral reimplantation and laparoscopic ureteral reimplantation for mega ureter. It's a multi-institutional study in 95 children. The success rate of the robotic surgery was 97%, and the success was defined as the improvement in the ultrasound parameters and also uh, non-obstructive curve and the uh, scintigraphic evaluation. 
there are also a few case reports published in the literature uh, showing that this procedure is feasible uh, for the treatment of mega ureter. I will present a case uh, from my department. Uh, this patient was nine months old, male, uh, having antenatal right hydroureter nephrosis. Uh, first, we started antibiotic prophylaxis, of course, but regardless of the antibiotic prophylaxis, the patient has got two significantly febrile urinary tract infection, which required hospitalization. Uh, and also, when you look at the ultrasound, uh, serial ultrasound, you can see that the AP diameter increased from 14 millimeter to 17 and then 21. The parenchyma thickness was decreased from 3 millimeter to 2.3 millimeters on the right side, and the distal ureteral diameter was increasing. So there was a progression on the ultrasound. Also, uh, he was symptomatic, but the, uh, with the febrile UTIs, the patient did not have a reflux as well. When we look at the uh, uh, when we look at the scintigraphic evaluation, on the left side you see the DMSA scan, and on the right side you see that the uh, MAC3 scan showed us there was an obstructed diagram on the right side. So that's why we decided uh, to treat this patient. So this is how we put the trocars. We put uh, three trocars, uh, one from the belly button and two instrument trocars on the uh, uh, lateral sides of the rectus muscles. And then we put an assistant port uh, just to give some uh, scissors uh, and uh, stitches as well. So this is how we see uh, in the intraoperative field. Now we are doing it uh, transperitoneally. You see the bladder in front of us, and you see the right ureter, which is massively dilated. And then also you see the vas deferens on the right side as well. I will show you a video about it. First, we open uh, the peritoneum on the right side. And then we identify the ureter just entering into the bladder. And then we try to mobilize it. we will go uh, and we will follow the distal ureter right into the entering uh, part of the bladder. We remove from the attachments. And then uh, we put a hitch stitch. I think this is uh, helping us to increase the view. If you consider that this patient is nine months old, although we do it in a transperitoneal way, um, we have a small amount of intraperitoneal field. So we use every trick uh, to help us. So now we are uh, marking the detrusor muscle because we are going to do it uh, just like a modified Lich Gregoire extravesical fashion. Now uh, we are creating the detrusor flaps on the right side. So <clears throat> We are cutting the um, muscular part. Uh, so you will see only the mucosa in the middle without the muscles over, uh, over it. Now we are marking uh, the distal part of the ureter, which we are going to cut. Because in this case, we decided to do excisional tapering and also in a dismembered fashion. We will remove the, you see the uh, distal stenotic part, we will remove it and we will do an excisional uh, tapering in this case. So that's why we first mark with the cautery. Some people use some hitch stitch also on the ureter, that's also possible, which I don't uh, use uh, generally. Now we are cutting the distal part of the ureter and we are uh, excising the abundant uh, tissue of the distal ureter. We will excise it. So this will help us to uh, achieve a narrow uh, or more anatomical uh, distal ureteral part. <clears throat> so
So we are making the last uh, adjustments. And then uh, now we are going to close the distal ureter. You can do it over uh, a feeding tube or over a, uh, an eight millimeter, or eight French or six French feeding tube. In this case, uh, somehow we didn't use it. Normally, we use it in many of our patients. So we continue uh, suturing up to the part that we have excised. We are using continuous uh, suturing, not the interrupted one. So we go up. In this case, we use uh, 5-0 grill for closure. So we don't have to go uh, very proximally uh, while excision uh, because uh, we only need to uh, make the uh, segments, only the distal part of the segment narrow, uh, the intramural part uh, of the bladder. So only four to five centimeters is enough for us. And then we insert the double J stent in an integrated fashion. Well, because the uh, proximal part is tortuosed, uh, this can be a little bit uh, bothering. But finally, we achieved to uh, put the uh, double J stent. Now we are excising the distal part, the stenotic part uh, of the ureter, which causes obstruction. So this is going to be a dismembered, excisional tapering, extra vesicle reimplantation. You see the bladder mucosa. And then this stenotic part is now being excised. <clears throat> now, first we are passing a stitch uh, on the posterior aspect of the ureter. And then we are inserting the double J stent into the bladder. And then we will continue with the anastomosis in a, a watertight fashion. Three or four stitches are enough for the closure. And after this uh, very distal anastomosis, we will proceed just like an extra vesicle Lich Gregoire uh, ureteral reimplantation. So I use top-down uh, suturing technique. We have published this in Journal of Endourology a few years ago. So we put the first stitch to the top. By this way, we elevate the ureter without any tension. And then this decreases uh, the trauma to the distal ureter as well. So it is important to pass the stitch in a half thickness, not the full thickness. Uh, of the detrusor muscle, because we don't want to make an obstruction of the ureter. Now we are creating the new hiatus. And then we put at least four to five more stitches down below to close up the detrusor muscle. So we basically wrap the ureter with the detrusor muscle. Finally, we fill the bladder just to see if there is any leak of uh, urine. And then we close up 
the peritoneal cavity. So this is one of our patients treated with uh, robotic surgery. Uh, as I said, he was nine months old. Finally, we close up the peritoneum. <clears throat> so this was the end of the procedure. The operative time was more than two hours. Uh, there was no complication encountered in the intraoperative and postoperative period. We removed the double J stent uh, one month after surgery. The distal ureteral diameter in the last follow-up was nine millimeters. So we had an improvement and the AP diameter was decreased to 12 millimeters. And we did not see any uh, urinary tract infection in this case. On the left side, you can see the ultrasound uh, of the kidney and ultrasound of the distal ureter. And on the right side, uh, you see the same kidney and the same distal ureter in the postoperative period. So we had an uh, improvement in this patient. So uh, I would like to share our uh, outcomes uh, of my hospital. Uh, in the last five years, we performed 168 robotic pediatric operations, and 64 of them were uh, robotic assisted laparoscopic extravesical ureteral reimplantation. As I said, the mega ureter numbers are low, uh, and in our uh, pub, uh, in our hospital, uh, there were five mega ureters that we treated in a robotic fashion. Uh, the, so the mean operative time was around two hours uh, for standard ureteral reimplantation, but for the mega ureter, uh, the operating uh, time was higher. On the right side. Uh, this was a picture of one of my patient's father. He was, an, uh, he was a painter, he was an artist. Uh, so I wanted to show this as well. The complication rates of our extravesical reimplantation are 7.8%. Uh, all of them are less than Clavian uh, 3B. We, have, we had two uh, urinary tract infections and one uh, urinary retention after uh, bilateral reimplantation. Uh, which resolved in uh, three weeks, uh, sorry, in uh, nine days after surgery. The success rate was uh, more than 95% in our case series as well. So the early recovery is possible. On the right side, this is one of our patients who was treated with robotic extravesical ureteral reimplantation. And after 24 hours, we can discharge the patient. I think this is the beauty of the uh, minimally invasive surgery. However, when we talk about uh, still robotic surgery uh, for reimplantation in mega ureter, uh, we are still here and we need some improvement. And we must say and admit that open surgery for mega ureter is still the gold standard. And robotic surgery should be reserved uh, as an alternative only in experienced robotic centers. The technique should be standardized as well. Uh, if we standardize the technique and if we do it in experienced hands, then we can have the advantages of minimally invasive treatment, just like less pain, less hospital stay, and better cosmetics. Also, those are uh, our international fellows coming to our hospital for uh, robotic surgery from our region. So if any of you is willing to come, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much. This was the end of my statement. Thank you a lot, uh, Selçuk, for your great presentation and this really clear uh, video. I'm really impressed by the quality of your uh, of this video and all of us know the quality of your laparoscopic and robotic skills. Uh, we have some questions for both of you. The, the first one is um, about the the DMSS cane, what do you do when you do a repeated scans and they are not comparable? How do you behave in case of equivocal cases, Professor Marini? Well, it's not extremely common no, to have um, different DMSA if they are performed in uh, the same center by experienced observators. If I have some doubts, I generally go and I go more and more frequently now for a euro I mean, uh, from uh, magnetic resonance urography. 
And anyhow, what I would like to point out is that uh, the decision to shift from a conservative treatment to a operative treatment is not taken only on the basis of a single exam. You have to evaluate the, uh, how the child behaves, how he is doing, if he has had infections, uh, if uh, the Generally, we try not to arrive at the point of having a drop in functional uh, of uh, in the function of the of, of the kidney, and in my experience, uh, the increase of dilatation of the uh, ureter and especially the increase of dilatation uh, of the pelvis and calyces uh, and the thinning of the parenchyma precedes the drop of function by approximately six months or something like that. So generally, when I see uh, dilata an increasing dilatation of, of the ureters and, uh, and the pelvis uh, in repeated scans, repeat done very close, uh, uh, I do not wait to have a drop in functional. OK, thank you for your explanation. Uh before starting with some question about surgery uh, to both of you, wh what is in your experience your first line treatment for symptomatic patient with a mega ureter? Yeah, if, if I start uh, with the symptomatic patients, first I would like to see if the patient is uh, under continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. If not, uh, then uh, first we should consider starting continuous antibiotic prophylaxis and then we follow the patients uh, for a while. Also, uh, I mean, uh, in a clinical scenario, most of the time, the urinary tract infections do not directly admit to pediatric urologists, but to pediatricians. And sometimes we, have, we should be suspicious about the uh, quality of those urine cultures uh, of uh, if, if it was clinical or not. So I should question the family if, it, uh, if the patient had a febrile UTI or not, uh, if uh, the urine was gathered in a correct way, um, just like with the catheter or not. Um, and if the amount of the um, organism is more than, uh, you know, 100,000. So afterwards, then uh, if under antibiotic prophylaxis, having recurrent UTIs, and then I should consider uh, about taking an intervention. Professor Malini, what's your first line treatment for media ureter? Well, it really depends on the age of the patient and uh, uh, all the other factors that, that I have pointed out uh, in, in my talk. If it is uh, a small child, I generally, if, uh, an infant uh, or under the age of one year, I generally try to insert uh, a double J stent. This is my first line, generally. I have done some really few refluxing uh, reimplantations, but I don't love them. Uh, I have not yet uh, experience uh, in uh, uh, balloon dilatation uh, for several reasons. Uh, and then if the child is older than one year of age or 18 months of age, of course, I go to surgery. Thank but you. I think I agree completely with uh, Professor Silai because uh, most of the patients uh, who arrive with a uh, uh, so-called story of infections. If you question them and you look at the cultures, uh, you find that uh, very few of them are real infections. True. So if we go deeper in the operation technique, uh, we have some questions for both of you. So first, how, you, how do you identify the non-peristaltic segments during the surgery? Well, if I start, I mean, <clears throat> during the surgery, I do not identify. I mean, I cannot identify, to be honest, because when we go to the surgery, um, I already uh, plan from the beginning. Um, I mean, if the patient has a recurrent UTI and increased hydronephrosis, and then um, I decide the surgery in beforehand. Of course, uh, when we do the reimplantation, we see that there is a narrowed segment on the distal part of the ureter, then we excise the distal part. Uh, if not, sometimes you do not need, need it. 
but in majority of them, uh, excisional, um, in my hands, I do excisional tapering and in a dismembered fashion. Uh, and I must say that majority of my cases, I do it in an open fashion as well, but uh, robotic surgery is an alternative for uh, our patients. Great. Well, I think that uh, it's not a difficult, it's not a, a situation comparable to megacolons for Hirschsprung disease, uh, where you really question uh, which is uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the pathological portion of the bowel, because sometimes uh, at inspection, you don't understand uh, immediately which is the very well innervated portion or, or so. In the mega ureteris, it's a quite a straightforward decision that you have a uh, dilated portion of the ureter. It's a very typical that the high dilated portion of the ureter, then you have a tight one. I generally tend to remove uh, the, the tight portion and also to remove uh, the part of the dilated, uh, dilated ureter if possible, because uh, I think that uh, uh, it makes, it's much, it makes much, uh, life much simpler and easier to reimplant a less dilated portion of the ureter. Thank you. So, so and what's, uh, how much length of ureter do you need to be tailored when you do a, a tapering or a tailoring? And what's the ratio that you use in your uh, daily surgical practice? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, uh, the answer is uh, clear. One to five ratio, the ureteral um, orifice diameter and the length of the intramural ureter should be one to five. Mm -hmm. So, in majority of our of the patients of the children, maybe three, four, or maximum five centimeters of um, tapering would be enough. Only the distal part should be okay. Uh, so we don't need to go uh, proximally. Well, I agree completely. I don't think that we needed to go maxim, much proximally also because uh, the risk of devascularizing the ureter is, uh, is real. The more you dissect the ureter, the more you devascularize it. I think that important point, the technical point, is that there should not be an abrupt change in diameter from the part that you the, the part that you remodel that you taper and the portion that you touch you left you leave intact so you, i don't like to have uh let's say eight or ten french uh, ureter uh, french size ureter and then uh, at 12 or 20 millimeters ureters immediately above so what i generally do i tend to do a tapering in uh, uh, taper more the distal portion of the ureter and a little bit less the most proximal part and uh, generally i add some star type applications above the tapered portion that just to have a smooth transition from a one part of the ureter and the other part of the ureter. Okay. It's, and uh, of course, uh, the, the most important part that to be tapered is the intravesicle. I generally follow the principles of a five to one. And uh, that's the reason why if the ureter is very much dilated, I mean, above 25, 30 millimeters, I prefer to use uh, the type of reimplantation that I have showed. Mm. Thank you. So, so do you, do you include the ureteral serosa to the suture of the detrusor when you do your implantation? I think that's the question for the extra vesicle uh, reimplantation, right. uh, because when we do it open in an intravesical way, we don't need it. Uh, well, to be honest, I don't do it. I just pass through the um, detrusor muscle uh, in a half thickness because I don't want the ureter to be obstructed. Uh, so I also make sure that um, there is no muscle fiber, detrusor fiber overlying the mucosa. So it should be intact uh, and no muscle fibers. And then I pass the detrusor uh, on one side and then uh, from the other side as well. So we wrap uh, the ureter uh, freely mobile. Okay. I don't pass uh, a stitch from the uh, serosa. It's what you have seen on your video, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a question for both of you. When you do surgery, how long do you recommend to have a stent? Or do you place a stent always? 
Well, for mega ureter, yeah, I do. Uh, I always put a stent um, and uh, at least uh, one month. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it can go up to uh, two months depending on your schedule. But at least four weeks in my hands. And <clears throat> well, it really depends. In the past, I used uh, uh, open catheters uh, that were exiting the patients, uh, the, the classical. The system that was described by Hardy Handron, but I mean many years ago, and they used to keep them uh, 10 to 12 days, which was a big problem for the patient. And now using uh, the double J stands, I keep them at least one month, uh, maybe some at least one month, generally between one and two months. Okay, so when I do uh, when I do reimplantation for by open approach for medial ureter. I don't place a GG stand for a long time. I think just for five or six days, and then I remove uh, on the bedside. So, okay, and you need now to know what's the best answer. But uh, so usually in the practice, you place a longer uh, stand than okay. So, and if you have a reflex after surgery or mega ureter, what's your best choice of management? Symptomatic reflex. Well. Good question. First, I should ask if this is a male or female. If, if it's a male and having a low grade of reflux, I think observation can be possible uh, if there are no symptoms. Um, but otherwise, of course, it becomes uh, it, it comes with recurrent urinary tract infections. Uh, depending on the degree of the reflux, we can do an injection, endoscopic injection, or uh, if a very high grade reflux, then we should consider doing uh, a revision, uh, reimplantation. Okay. Um, I think that if we have a very high grade reflux uh, and we have done a tapered reimplantation, the first thing we have to think about uh, is the presence of a fistula between the, the ureter and the bladder. And this happened in the past, especially when you do a tapered. Uh, if you resect the, the wall of the ureter, it may happen that you have a fistula. And this is, uh, in my experience, uh, the uh, frequent cause, not, not really frequent, I have seen it two or twice or three times in my, uh, in my career, but most of the mega ureters uh, go very well. They have no problems. And uh, it's extremely strange, especially using, extremely rare, especially using the technique that I have shown uh, that they have reflux. I had only one case of reflux uh, that I have treated satisfactorily with injection. And uh, there are the cases that I have seen that uh, had been done elsewhere. Actually, they came to, they were referred to me. They all were cases uh, of a fistula between uh, the, the, in the ureter at the entry point in the blood. Okay. So we have three more questions. Uh, one is always about indication. So do you start straight away with reimplantation uh, or do you use balloon dilatation? And which one you think is your first line treatment? And do you jump someone sometimes directly to implantation if you think that balloon dilatation won't work? Can, can you repeat again? Sorry. So is surgery your first option to, do, to, to treat mega ureter or do you use balloon dilatation? Or sometimes do you use straight away reimplantation when you think that balloon dilatation won't work? So what's your algorithm of choice? What's your management plan? Well, I think the individual decision uh, according to the patient's uh, characteristics uh, is the answer. But uh, if I uh, think of doing um, endoscopic uh, treatment, uh, just like as Emilio said, um, I don't do uh, balloon dilatation. I put a double J stand and I observe the patient, especially if the patient is an infant and having a, a symptomatic disease. Um, and uh, I try to bring the patient up to two years old. Uh, if, um, if there is an improvement, then it's okay. But if there is no improvement, then I will go for reimplantation in those cases. 
Well, to be honest, it's it's a surgical preference, but I don't do balloon dilatation in my center. Professor Melini? Well, I, I have already said I don't do balloon dilatation. Uh, I think that uh, this might be uh, uh, something that uh, will have a uh, will gain popularity in the future because it's a simple, is not, not invasive. Um, I had no opportunity to, to do the balloon dilatation uh, and I didn't actually find the need to do it. Uh, I think that uh, in many cases, uh, or I think that in many cases, uh, the indications for doing balloon dilatation in an infant are not so clear. So it's, it's something that we use now for first-line treatments. So if someone is symptomatic with a febrile UTI or the trees in renal infarction, we use it now in our center with Dr. Fei Jawen. And we have really, really good results. And it drops the number of patients where <coughs> we do reimplantation. But we need now to focus on long-term follow-up to be sure that it really works on a long-term period. So, and we have but, a, yeah, I'm sorry. Matthew, can I ask you yes. from, from which months old or, or which age uh, you start doing balloon dilatation and what size of uh, balloons can you use? So we use, uh, so the, the youngest child was four months old, which is not common, but it was done mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for these patients. And we use um, uh, uh, four, uh, a French four catheter to do a uh, to do the dilatation, mm -hmm. um, and actually, um, um, if I've been done really clearly by someone who is expert in endurology, who know how to actually to 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 go into the meatish, which can be really challenging, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. and then if you wait really five minutes and you count down the five minutes of dilation. It, and you have this special mark on your screen, it works. We yeah. do always place a, cafe, um, a GG stent at the end. I know that some teams don't do that and they prove that it's not uh, always uh, useful. But now we, we, we change our plan and we use uh, endurology first treatment as a first treatment. So I, I just want to have, uh, do you, you have a question for you, Salshuk, uh, about so if you have a reflex or a failure after robotic implantation, will you do mm -hmm. a redo by robotics or will you do your open approach? <clears throat> well, I, I, you know, my experience is also limited, just like with the literature. The largest series is 18 patients in Philadelphia. Uh, the other one was uh, multicentric. And in my center, we did five cases. But if I talk about, for example, pyeloplasty, Yes, we do robotic pyeloplasty. And then if uh, there is a, a need for a re-intervention, we do it in a robotic fashion. But for the mega ureter, to be honest, I did not have any patient, uh, I mean, because of the lack of numbers, probably. Okay, so we have two more questions. One is about what, what do you do in case of a simultaneous UPGO and UBGO obstruction? Do you do the same technique at the same time? Do you start with mega ureter and then UPGO or the opposite? Professor Malini, do you, do you have any well, answer for this kind of tricky I don't, questions? I don't think that you can give, uh, uh, you can answer in a very straightforward way because every case is uh, different uh, from the other. And uh, Generally speaking, generally speaking, I think that uh, mega ureters uh, are better um, uh, um, the child does better with the mega ureter rather than a UPJ obstruction because uh, the <clears throat> the pressure inside of the uh, inside of the, the cavity is less. If uh, you have a, a bigger cavity, uh, I mean, uh, if you have the ureter and the PUJ and the uh, and, uh, hydronephrosis, but I think that they are, they are extremely rare cases. Uh, my in, impression, all the cases where they had a doubt uh, about that, I remember 
really only few few cases uh, that I have treated. If I am sure, because if you have a very tight uh, uh, UPJ obstruction, you don't, you cannot have a mega ureter because there is not enough urine to, to fill it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may happen. It happened to me that I repaired the UPJ and then I found a, a dilated ureter and then I did the dilated ureter. In many other cases where I had a doubt about the obstruction or the obstructive pattern in uh, the UPJ, I did the mega, and cases that I did the mega ureter, I can remember only two or three cases uh, where I did the mega ureter, and then I had to go back and do also the UPJ in the six months time or something like that. But of course, every case should be uh, considered. And in many cases uh, where you think you have a UPJ obstruction associated with the mega ureter, in reality, reducing the Mm, reducing uh, the dilatation of the ureter, it disappears also the kinking effect on the UPJ. So I think that every case should be considered uh, separately, and I can give you, I cannot give you any rule actually. Well, I <clears throat> I agree with Emilio. I think they say that it's like uh, five to ten percent uh, that UPJ ob obstruction can accompany UVJ obstruction. But uh, also in my experience, uh, I did not have any case. Uh, if I go with the, for the mega ureter, I don't think that there is also a UPJ obstruction. At, at least I didn't find. But in, in, uh, in reverse, uh, when I do a pyeloplasty, just like Emilio said, sometimes if I find a difficulty to pass the stent through the UVJ, if this is the question of uh, our friend from the audience, then what I do is first I do the pyeloplasty. I put a transanastomatic stent, uh, which is externalized uh, because we, we cannot put the double J into the bladder. Uh, and then um, after a while, I go uh, in a second uh, session uh, for the UVJ if required. Mm. Uh, so I think this was uh, the case. I, I had a couple of cases, maybe two cases just like this. And uh, of course, when you do first UPJ and then you do the mega ureter, you must pay a lot of attention because the ureters risk to be completely yeah. devascularized because you cut the main uh, arteries that go to the ureters. So that's the reason why I should offer a word of caution and not to be too brilliant about doing both the surgery at the same time because you may turn out to have a completely necrotic ureter. Okay, I, I will uh, finish with the last question. What's the, the age, the best age to do reimplantation surgically? Just a number. Or For mega ureter? Yeah. <clears throat> I think I would say uh, around two years old. Uh, or one to one to two, between one to two. Okay. And you're pushing Malini? 18 to 24 months. Good. Thank you again. So Thank there you was, very much. There was the last question about secondary mediator, but it could be the topic of a second webinar about uh, bladder outlet obstruction and secondary mediator. So I would like to thank you both of you for your excellent talks and your uh, interesting answer. I would like also to thank uh, Christelle, Jacobin, and Nina from the European School of Urology for the help and support. And now, of course, I would like to thank you again, all the attending, uh, to all the people who attended this uh, webinar. So next week, the European School of Urology will host a new webinar about uh, PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer will be far away from pediatric urology. And thank you again, uh, EAU, ESPU, and ESPU Education Committee for all this tremendous work for education. Goodbye. And thank, thank you, you so much. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much. Th bye -bye. Thank you so much, Mathieu. And, uh, Goodbye and see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.